Hello and welcome to Star Diary, the podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. You can subscribe to the digital edition of the magazine by visiting iTunes, Google Play or Apple News, or to the print edition by visiting skyatnightmagazine.com. Greetings listeners, and welcome to Star Diary, a weekly guide to the best things to see in the Northern Hemisphere's night sky. As we're based here in the UK, all times are in BST. In this episode, we'll be covering the coming week from the 28th of April to the 4th of May. I'm Features Editor Ezzie Pearson, and I'm joined this week by astronomy writer Katrin Rayner. Hello, Katrin. Hi, Ezzie. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing this morning? I'm all right, thank you. Excited to talk about what we have to look forward to this week. Ooh, excellent. <laughs> Let's hear about it. What do we have coming up? <laughs> okay, so the moon is in the spotlight this week. It's teaming up with a few night sky objects, including Jupiter and Mars. And there are also quite a few planets at their best this week. And there is a real buzz hmm, about the Beehive Cluster for the first week or two of May. And this week is also a great opportunity to set your sights on another minor planet. A real buzz about the Beehive, uh, of course. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so please, let's get us started. Where should we start this week? So moon-wise, on the 2nd of May, we have a 32% lit waxing moon near Castor and Pollux in the constellation of Gemini. If you aren't sure which stars are Castor and Pollux, they're basically the two brightest stars in a straight line above the moon. So the moon is going to be below Pollux. So this, this will be really lovely to see. It's, it's always nice to see an object quite close or in mm. a constellation. So, yeah. yeah, I think when I did the recording last time, we had Mars yeah and gemini and i said oh it looked like it's got a little heart so mars was forming a sort of like little l with castor and pollux and and oh. this time it's now the moon's turn oh, yeah. to point the way that's right so... it's it's again it's very good but for people who are just starting out because mm. just have sort of going from the patterns that are you have on a star chart up to the sky can sometimes be a bit tricky to do and you're not really sure where you're trying to get started whereas if you can say like the moon is here that gives you a place to kind of yes. orientate yourself and, and understand what you're doing. Yes, yeah, like the moon is the pointer because mm. sometimes we star hop, don't we? So yeah. it's nice to use a moon or planet. So yeah, so hopefully people will be able to, to make out Gemini when they're looking at the moon. And on the fourth, we have the first quarter moon. So during the first quarter moon phase, half of the moon's visible surface appears illuminated, resembling a half circle and last week we spoke about the moon being in its last quarter phase so you know it, it can sound confusing I think the terminology because you you think well if it's a quarter moon then why is half of it mm. lit <laughs> so because we're only seeing half of it to begin with when it's a full moon it's actually a half moon because you can only see half of the moon because oh, yes, you can't see yeah. the back of it True. so it is a bit weird when you think of it like that but yeah that, that's basically how it's working yeah because because when you see the one side, don't we? So we think, oh, well, that's the whole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't start referring to the full moon as the half moon, though. That's just no, confusion. Yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> well, as we mentioned last week, astronomy terminology is confusing it's enough. It's confusing so enough. We well, don't need could, to do any more. You could throw it into the mix if you like. And <laughs> but yeah, maybe not. So, so yeah, so the first quarter moon is when it's halfway between the new moon and the full moon. And it's also, oh my gosh, dare I mention this because it's so cheesy, Star Wars Day. <laughs> May so, the 4th, of yeah. course. May the 4th be with you, Ezzy. I would do my Chewbacca impression, but I'll save it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, do you know what? Funny enough, I was looking at the crossover between Star Wars and astronomy, mm -hmm. and lo and behold, I came across a really interesting article from you oh, really? that you wrote about Star Wars and astronomy. So yeah, there's... There's a really interesting connection between the fictional film series and astronomy. So, yeah, it's been, you know, the film's been a huge inspiration for astronomers in terms of space travel. There's been, uh, I remember a couple of years ago, I wrote an article about all of the different planets that there were in Star Wars and had we found any equivalents of them and things like that, which was, was quite interesting. Yeah. Is, is like, as we get more and more exoplanets, are we finding things close to what we've imagined? It's quite yeah. an interesting thought. Yeah, no, it was really interesting to read that. So, uh, yeah, 
So I hope everyone will be watching Star Wars now with maybe a renewed <laughs> astronomy interest. <laughs> there is a lot of space magic, but there is actual like interesting sci-fi stuff in there as well. Yeah, absolutely. So it's probably something I might actually start looking into. A nice topic to learn about. So yeah, we'll leave Chewbacca and Luke Skywalker behind and move on to the solar system now, back to April. So on the 28th of April, bright Venus can be spotted in the eastern sky at around quarter past five in the morning, seven degrees above the horizon. And if you look closely, Saturn can be seen below and slightly to the right of Venus at around 4.5 degrees above the horizon. But as you have guessed, because Saturn is now in the morning sky, it's, you know, it's going to be challenging to spot, if at all. Saturn's going to be just under magnitude plus one compared to Venus, which will be a very dazzling minus 4.4. So, yeah, good luck, you know, as we, we mentioned at the beginning, using pointers in the sky to find other objects. You could try and use Venus to, to locate Saturn, but I'm not too sure if, you know, you will 100% be able to to see that with binoculars or a telescope. If you do, let us know. Mm -hmm. yeah, we always love to hear from you. I put the contact email in the show notes below. Contact us at skyatnightmagazine.com. Please do let us know if you've managed to, to see anything that we've mentioned on the podcast. Excellent. Yeah. And then on the 30th of April, the moon and Jupiter are close by. So if you look to the west, northwest, as the sun is going down, you'll see a 13% lit waxing crescent moon and bright Jupiter. This is going to be nice to watch as the sky darkens up until when they both set. So Jupiter sets not long after midnight and the moon just after 1am. And if you're wondering what the bright star next to the moon is, it is Elnath, which is the second brightest star in the constellation of Taurus. And that also sounds like a planet from Star Wars, doesn't it, Elnath? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so... Elnath also borders the constellation of Auriga. So, yeah, something really lovely there. You know, they'll kind of look like they're in a bit of a line, I suppose, the three of them. Mm -hmm. And the 30th of April is also the best time to see Venus, around half an hour before sunrise. It's low on the eastern horizon and shining brightly at magnitude minus 4.4. And we also have Saturn at its best today, around the same time as Venus. But as I mentioned earlier, you know, it's going to be a tricky naked eye target, if, if at all. And certainly with binoculars or telescopes, you may be lucky enough to see it or not. <laughs> <laughs> so the 1st of May, moving into May now, you know, we started a new month planetary wise. It's the best time to see Jupiter and Mars. A really good way to start the month. We have Mars in the constellation of Cancer. The red planet's going to be best viewed after 10 p.m., when it reaches a pleasing position of around 43 degrees above the southwest horizon. And we also have Jupiter best viewed at the same time as Mars. It is going to be lower above the horizon, around 17 degrees, visible in the west, northwest. So yeah, you'll just have to draw your eyes down and to the right from Mars to spot Jupiter. And Mars, well, Mars is in the news, the astronomy news, I suppose, if you like. <laughs> As May kicks off, Mars and the Beehive Cluster M44 make observing opportunities not to be missed. So the constellation of Cancer in which the Beehive Cluster sits is well-placed and throughout the first nine days of May or so, you can watch the red planet glide around the open star cluster. So yeah, I was interested, you know, to read about Beehive because I was like, well, it doesn't really look like a beehive. Mm. but it's supposed to resemble a swarm of bees. And you can see why, I guess, because there's a lot of stars. <laughs> I can see, yeah, it looks like a swarm of bees because like most clusters do look like a swarm of bees, mm. to be honest. There's yeah. just lots of stars all grouped together. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so they look quite like orangey, don't they? And, mm. and white blue. So, yeah. So, yeah, the beehive cluster, it's also known as Precipi. Precipi. Pre Precipi. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I did have to look that one up because, again, it's one of those astronomical terms that I never really kind of say to people. Mm -hmm. We'll go with precipe, yeah. I think, which is Latin for the manger or cot. And it's a really fascinating object. It contains a larger population of stars than other nearby bright open clusters. It holds around a thousand stars. It's a lot of stars. <laughs> it's, it's a lot, yeah. So under dark skies, you know, 
this cluster looks like a small nebulous object to the naked eye and it has been known since ancient times. Galileo studied it with his telescope. So yeah, it's a well-known cluster. It's, it's been around the block, shall we say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes it's like you look at something and you say, like, why was it called the beehive? And sometimes it's because you need to look at it with a telescope that was of the quality that Galileo had. And then it starts making sense. Yeah. Sometimes it's just our stuff's too good and we can see too many stars now. (laughs) Yeah. And now nothing looks like what it was called. Yeah. Though I think with this one, like saying it looks like a a swarm of bees. Yeah. No, that's fair. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) We can see that one. So, yeah, Mars has faded somewhat since its last opposition in January. It's now around magnitude plus one. So, it you know, it's still easy to spot. It's unmistakable in the sky because it, it is orange. So, yeah, just the fact that it's kind of gotten a bit dimmer, it's not going to hinder you. And on the night of the 2nd of May, I've just gone with half past 10 here for a time. So just because I thought, you know, it's, it's going to be dark. then. so, yeah, after half past 10 on the night of the 2nd of May in the West, Mars will be located just to the right of the Beehive Cluster. So is that when you're you're basically just waiting for it to get dark enough to see it well? Yeah, because, well, you know, it's a good point, isn't it? Because this time of year, we're approaching the summer solstice, really, aren't we? Yeah. It's going to be a, a few weeks away. So, yeah, it's, it's difficult. This guy never really properly gets dark, does it? But I'm assuming, you know, after half past ten, it's going to be high in the sky and dark enough to see it. And on the night of the 3rd of May, so the following night at the same time, half past 10, Mars will have moved upwards compared to the previous night, and it's now going to be located to the northwest of the Beehive Cluster's border. And the 43% lit waxing moon, it's joining the party tonight too. And if we have clear skies, it's going to be a really magical sight to see. And as the night of the 3rd progresses and we move into the early hours of the 4th of May, the moon will be passing above Mars. So yeah, if if you fancy a late night observing these three objects moving around the sky, it's it's going to be really lovely. Mm. The following night on the 4th of May then, Mars is very close to the Beehive Cluster and this is as close as the planet will get to it and the moon is going to be located to the left of the duo. So yeah, so you've got three nights there of hopefully clear skies and you can get out and Mm-hmm. and watch Mars, the Beehive Cluster and the Moon. Yeah, and again, it's that helping you find your way to the Beehive Cluster and also just, it's always nice when these things line up, so hopefully yeah. some people will be able to see those. Yeah. On the 2nd of May, we have Asteroid 4 Vesta opposition. It's magnitude plus 5.7 and can be located in the constellation of Libra. It is a naked eye target within dark sky areas, and for those, you know, more experienced asteroid hunters, hopefully you may be able to see that with your naked eye. But for those who aren't well versed in the hunt for asteroids, you're going to have to grab a pair of binoculars to try and hunt it down or, or use your telescope. And there is a really great guide in the May issue of the Sky at Night if you want to give Vesta a go. And of course, obvious explanation, just wait until the sky gets dark to make this easier for your observing. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, the darker is the better. you you want a dark sky to be able to see that. Yes. So good luck with that one as well. And yeah, Mercury, Uranus and Neptune, unobservable this month, but there's there's plenty happening to to keep us busy. I think between Venus and Mars and Jupiter, they're holding up the (laughs) team. Yeah, they are. (laughs) Yeah, so no worries on that front. Well, sounds like there's a lot of really interesting things to see in this week's night sky. Thank you for taking us through all of those, Catherine. And if our listeners at home would like even more updates about what's going on in the night sky, please do subscribe to the Star Diary podcast and we will be back here next week. But for now, let's summarise this week again. On the 28th of April, bright Venus can be spotted in the eastern sky at around 5.15am. On the 30th of April, the Moon and Jupiter are close to each other. Look to the west-northwest as the Sun is going down to see a 13% lit waxing crescent Moon and bright Jupiter together. The best time to see Venus is around 30 minutes before sunrise. Saturn is at its best today, around the same time as Venus, but it will still be a tricky naked eye target. On the 1st of May is the best time to see Jupiter and Mars as well. On the 2nd of May, the 32% lit waxing moon will be near Castor and Pollux. 
On the night of the 2nd, Mars will be located just to the right of the Beehive Cluster, and asteroid Vesta is at opposition that night as well on the 2nd. On the 3rd of May, Mars will have moved upwards compared to previous nights and will now be located to the northwest of Beehive Cluster's border. The 43% lit waxing moon will also be close by. And on the 4th, it will be the first quarter moon as well. So lots of things to see in this week's night sky, and hopefully we'll see you back here next week. Until then, from all of us at Star Diary, goodbye. If you want to find out even more spectacular sights that will be gracing the night sky this month, be sure to pick up a copy of BBC Sky at Night magazine, where we have a 16-page pull-out sky guide with a full overview of everything worth looking up for throughout the whole month. Whether you like to look at the moon, the planets or the deep sky, whether you use binoculars, telescopes or neither, our sky guide has got you covered, with detailed star charts to help you track your way across the night sky. From all of us here at BBC Sky at Night magazine, goodbye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Star Diary podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. For more of our podcasts, visit our website at skyatnightmagazine.com slash podcasts or head to Spotify, iTunes or your favourite podcast player. Star Diary.